Welcome to the Medical Muse podcast. Discover the humanistic aspects of physicians and scientists as they describe their career paths and any advice they have for current medical students. Each episode, we interview a new guest and discuss the future of the field. This is the Medical Muse. Okay, hey everyone. Uh, we have our chief residents from Mount Sinai Internal Medicine with us today. We're very happy to have them. We have uh, Dr. Muzaffar from Nova, who did our medical school and osteopathic degree from Nova Southeastern University. Dr. Pardominski, who completed his medical training in Peru, and Dr. Mansour, who comp completed his medical training at FIU, and we're very excited to have him today. So thank you. Hi, thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Happy so to be welcome here. Welcome to the Medical Muse podcast. Um, first, I'll start just by having you guys tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe like where you're originally from. Um, since there's three of y'all today uh, and you're all not just kind of talking at once, I will start with you, Dr. Mansour. Okay, sure. Um, so, hey, everybody. My name is Ephraim. Um, I'm born and raised in Miami, Florida. Um, I went to FIU for undergrad. Um, FIU again for med school and then um, during med school I rotated at Sinai I loved it um, and then was happy or fortunate enough to match in internal medicine over there um, I loved it so much that I decided to stay on for an extra year um, to do some teaching as a chief resident and then um, as part of that journey I fell in love with pulmonary critical care and I'm happy to say that I matched in the pulm crit uh, back in I guess end of November, beginning of December, um, and I'll be at U uh, University of Florida for fellowship in July. And here we are. <laughs> yeah, congratulations on that match. Hey, That's very exciting. Thank you. And Dr. Um, Dr. Muzaffar, do you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about, about you? Yes, I will. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, so my, my name is Zuleika. I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, but I grew up in uh, Miami, Florida. I went to undergrad at FIU and I actually studied being a dietitian. And I actually worked as a dietitian in Mount Sinai Medical Center. And during that experience, that is what inspired me to do a career in medicine. Uh, and I just loved like seeing the residents around and they look like they're having such a fun time and I really, really enjoyed learning about medicine. Uh, so that's when I decided to pursue a career in medicine. So I went to Nova and like Ephraim, we're, I'm doing a fourth year chief year as well. And um, I matched in pulmonary critical care at UMass. So I'm excited to see the snow <laughs> next year. I've never left South Florida. So that's going to be um, an exciting time for me and an exciting experience. Congratulations to you as well. It's Thank very you. exciting. And Dr. Um, for you, Domensky, can you please tell us a little about a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, my name is Ruben. Uh, you can call me Ruben, by the way. Um, I was born and raised in Peru. I, I did medical school there. It's called Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia. Kind of mouthful, but super proud of coming out of there. Um, I did a little bit of work there two years before coming here. I studied for the boards, I, uh, for the steps, I took them and I came here three and change years ago uh, for internal medicine residency. I loved it here um, and I decided to stay an additional year. I, I wanted to contribute to the program and I love education. So I decided to stay just like my coach chief just said. Um, and I just matched at Oshner um, Clinic in New Orleans for cardiology. So I'm super excited for that too. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So, so how did how did you originally find out about Mount Sinai from Peru? So when you're a international, it's, it's funny, we were talking about this before, is uh, you, you can have the experience here from three different, we say this in all interviews, you have the experience from three different uh, phases of medicine. You have MD, DO, and IMG. So as an IMG, I think when you apply, you try to look for, you apply rather broadly. And you try to look for um, programs that could fit you, but you really don't know because we don't do rotations. We don't have a lot of comments from people. Maybe you heard some stuff. Um, the first thing I knew about my uh, about uh, Monsana it was that it was in Miami. I had family close by, a little bit north, but that was one of the reasons why I decided to apply in in, in this area. 
And actually, I was the first, and I, I, I hope I'm not wrong, they told me that, but I was the first online interview back when there were no online interviews. So I didn't even know the program, I didn't know anything, but I just felt a very good connection with the brand director and associate brand director with Dr. Tu and Dr. Rivera. And I knew it was a place I would be happy being at. So I guess it was a little bit of luck, a little bit of just life circumstances, and I ended up saying a program that I love. So that's a little bit of the story. And how, I guess we can start with you, Dr. Mansour. Um, mm -hmm. Where did your interest in internal medicine come from? What made you seek an internal medicine residency versus all the other specialties? Sure. So I think like, um, like most uh, med students, pretty much on rotation. Um, for a little bit, I was thinking about emergency medicine. Um, a lot of my friends in med school during the preclinical years were all going into EM. It seemed pretty cool. Um, I, I knew I liked the people, but then uh, when I rotated in internal medicine, I thought it was cool how you end up, um, although sometimes you know sometimes you are the person that, that the patient needs, other times you're able to bring the right people to them. So thinking about like consulting or, or what have you. So I felt like it was good to be the facilitator and I wanted to, to be able to do that. And con contrasting internal medicine with uh, emergency medicine, when I was on my EM rotation, I always felt like I was asking myself, you know, hey, whatever happened to that person? And and I feel like in internal medicine, for the most part, you see the patient from start to finish. Um, and so it was nice to facilitate a lot of things that they needed and also to see, kind of carry it through and see, you know, they show up to the hospital, we take care of them and then send them off. And that was part of the reason I wanted to do palm crit too, because um, I felt like when they get sick enough to go to the ICU, you miss we I, we didn't get to see that and then when I was a resident I got to see like okay so that's what's next um, yeah that's, that's incredibly interesting um, thank you for sharing that and uh, Dr. Muzaffar what I know you touched upon it a little bit but um, you know what made you interested in going into internal medicine so um, when I was a dietitian I actually uh, specialized in like critical care and nutrition so I knew that that was a population that I always wanted to treat um, at that time the intensivists whom I work with I, they actually came from different backgrounds so I had one that did emergency medicine one that did anesthesia and yeah. one that had done internal medicine and they all try to convince me each way which one like they thought and you know anesthesia is going to better prepare you this one is going to better prepare you but I really felt you know at the time it was a surgical ICU and I felt like the path that would best prepare me to be a well-rounded pulmonary critical care physician was going to be um, internal medicine. Um, I didn't like the I didn't like ER that much. I didn't see myself like I know ICU obviously is intense, but I didn't like the fast that different type of fast pace as as ER. And I felt like anesthesia, even though I liked it, I didn't see myself like going through that training. And I felt like I could easily build and enhance my internal medicine knowledge when I go to fellowship. So that's why I chose um, internal medicine. That's amazing. And uh, to you know, talk more a little bit about uh, the residency experience, what have each of your experiences been like so far going through internal medicine residency, residency from being PGY1s to now chief residents? Um, Dr. Muzaffar, if you want to start us off. Sure. Um... The experience has been quite a, a different one for us because um, our class in particular uh, got to participate or, or treat COVID patients all three years of residency. So I think our experience is a little different. Um, I feel like, but it is nice to know, especially now that we're working as junior attendings, like you do see your growth um, as a clinician, as well as a lot of personal growth that you see throughout the years, like things that I that as a PGY1, or even when I look at the med students or PGY1 that once now, like I see myself in them and I see how far I've come, whether it's like looking things up in Epic, like obviously you're a little bit more efficient in doing that or learning to write notes really quickly. Um, I just think the experience, especially at Mount Sinai, it's like a great supportive environment. And I know, you know like, especially in the pandemic, um, I, I always recommend people, we always tell residents like, or med students, make sure and go in somewhere where you feel you're going to be supportive and you feel like you're going to fit in. Because the, uh, the three of us, we were part of you know, a class of 17 and we all got along incredibly well and we really supported each other. And I don't think, I, I think if we didn't have that, we would have had a different experience in residency. And your first year was um, almost a little bit more than halfway over when the COVID pandemic started or? Yes. Okay. So well, actually, for, actually for our first year, um, we, 
Um, yeah, we were basically second years by the end of the first year. There was like an automatic, I remember my senior saying, I was, I was going for my senior to pre-round. And he was like, no, 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 <laughs> we're not doing that anymore. You have your patience, you present to the attending. Um, it was a earlier upgrade. Of course, he was still supervised. We still felt supported. I never, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say that there was not a point that I felt that I wasn't supported by my, at that point, it became my co-resident instead of my my senior. But yeah, we had to 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 mature fast because of all all the craziness that was coming. Um, but yeah, we 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 had that at the end of the the first year. Was it now that you know, uh, Doctor Prodominski? Now that you were kind of getting through, you know, uh, more residency and you saw more of what Sana was about. How was your experience, and was it everything you expected and more? Yeah, no, it was amazing. Um, you know, when you come here. You have no idea what it's going to be. Um, of course, when I came from Peru, um, I work in public and private hospitals. So I've seen a lot of different things in Peru. It was really interesting to see how it was um, different. The work um, I did here from Peru, there's a lot more resources. Um, is But it's interesting that the medical knowledge is, is, up, is held very highly in both places. I really liked how in the places that I was trained, research was very highly thought of and papers were, were were always brought up about the new studies and everything of course when i came to the us it was interesting to see sometimes how it was easier to get access to those papers or um try to be part of um those papers so and of course the resources that you have you can order an mri or have a crash card next to your patient and those are things that you don't always have um, in all the hospitals in Peru. Um, I, I love my training, of course, in Peru, and I love my training here in the in the U.S. I learned a lot during these three years, and again, I'm super grateful for 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 all the support and everything that I've learned. It's been a growth. I'm gonna second everything that Zuleika just said. It's been a growth. We learned a lot. It's been it's been amazing. And we see we see we see ourselves now as as junior attendings. I remember what it was like to be interns and it's it's crazy it's crazy i can imagine and quick follow-up to that were there any kind of unique skills or experiences that you had in peru that you thought were uh you know well translated into this system or that gave you a little bit of an advantage coming into the system um i think uh, when i finish training in peru you have to be able to be a general practitioner you because after the uh, medical school, most of the people go to do rural uh, work. That's part of the training, and before you go into the specialty in residency or fellowship. So by the time I finished medical school, I was already doing central lines. I was doing LPs. Um, um, I, I had exposure to a lot of pathologies, and you know, I was. I still now looking back, I I still had a lot to learn. But I was ready to 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 do a lot of things and and to practice a lot of things. So when I became an intern, I felt the initial shock was about how to do things in this new system. How to? I, I remember the first night I had a patient that had a GI bleeding, um, and I knew I had to transfuse. And I was in front of the computer. I was very frustrated in just being in front of the computer and being like, "I need to transfuse this patient. I don't know how." I called my senior, and she was like, "Don't worry, I'll be there. I'll help you." Um, so a lot of the things that I learned in Peru helped me a lot in being a, a great intern here. Wow. Did you practice after medical school in Peru at all, or did you come straight to residency once you graduated? Or I guess you I did internship there. I did. I did. So the internship is the last year of medical school. Okay. Um, that's how it's called. And you do night float and you do everything. Um, then I I work in research for a couple of months. I continue more in the administrative part and then just continue doing research. I actually work as a medical advisor in a pharmaceutical, but I ended up being, it was a hybrid between a hospitalist and a resident in a, in a local community hospital. Um, it was a small hospital and I was able to work there and see a lot of patients. So I got that practice before coming here. Very good. And mm -hmm. Dr. Mansour. Um, I was lucky enough to be there the first day that you worked as an attending physician and you brought us donuts. I don't know if that's common for people to bring donuts on their first day, but it was wonderful as a medical student. 
But um, can you tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, kind of like what is a chief resident and, and why do people typically choose to do um, a chief year? Sure. Um, so I can, uh, by the way, the donuts were a bribe to over to for you to overlook, you know, my, my the first day rookie mistake. But um, as far as what a chief year is, so there's generally in internal medicine, there's generally two options, either a third year chief. So while, while you're still an internal medicine resident um, or a fourth year chief, so you finish an internal medicine residency, which is typically three years, you graduate, but you stay on for a year. Um, both positions have some degree of an administrative role. So you're in charge of scheduling, you coordinate uh, certain things for the program. Um, as a fourth year chief, from what I've heard from my friends that are also fourth year chiefs, um, compared to third year chiefs, we do um, attending. So we are junior attending, we see patients, we supervise residents. Um, and then I, and I'm not sure if this is ubiquitous or kind of found everywhere. Um, we, as a, the three of us are in charge of different types of academics for the program. So we frequently will lead lectures. Uh, we'll coordinate with other, with guest speakers to come and do grand rounds for us. Um, as far as reasons for doing chief, I can't really speak for, for the rest of the country, but I know the three of us, we are, we're interested in uh, medical education and teaching. So this was kind of a way, at least for me, that this was kind of a way to test drive that. I think, I think Ruben can agree. Um, and then the other piece is for people thinking about doing like program leadership after um, residency training. Um, it's a great way to get that behind the scenes view and also saves you time because officially, I think this is an ACGME thing to qualify as, but, but please somebody fact check me. Um, to become an associate program director or a program director, if, if you don't do a chief year, you have to work as a core faculty for five years within a residency program. Um, so that's like working with residents, participating on research projects. If you do a chief year, you can do that um, as soon as you're done. Does that make sense? Oh, wow. So yeah. rather than five rather years? than wait, yeah, sure. rather than kind of put in your five years, you can theoretically the one year of chief year provides the necessary experience um, to kind of do that. Um, so yeah, so to kind of all that to say, if you're interested in medical education, you like teaching and maybe want to do a leadership position, those are probably reasons to do that. Some people also um, use the chief year as time, as a way to gain a little bit of extra time for fellowship applications or to kind of sort out your life. Um, and along those lines, I do want to plug internal medicine for that too, aside from being a great facilitator for your patients. I liked it because I knew that I liked a little bit of everything and it was a great way to prolong my decision-making process and you know, give myself another three years to figure out exactly what specialty I wanted. Um, and there's a lot of options, so so it works out. That's awesome. <laughs> and just as a follow-up to that, is did your passion for teaching, was that kind of always there? Or did, were you inspired by kind of like how you were taught in your, you know, through your residency and that kind of inspired you to go on and become a chief or a little bit of both? Um, I would say both. I think um, the the sort of passion for teaching goes goes back to undergrad um, at FIU. Um, I was a physics like teaching assistant, learning assistant, um, working with students in the physics lab. Um, and I really liked that and kind of that sparked it. And then in med school, I did a little bit of the mentoring and teaching like physical exam skills so that stayed on. Um, and then in residency, I admired my chiefs. They were all very, really nice people, but also great teachers. To this day that I, we kind of, and I think the three of us can kind of speak to that. Like, um, you'll always remember your chiefs when you're in residency, um, for better or worse. I'm just kidding. But uh, most hopefully for better. But um, I'm going to still... send this, I'm going to send this to Hernando, to Israel, and to Daniela. <laughs> um, shout out to them because honestly, they were really superb teachers. And, and a lot of what I do when I think about, you know, how do I approach this, this situation, whether it's like, how do I teach this point or how do I manage this patient or this resident or whatever? Um, I think about, it's kind of cheesy, but it's like, oh, what would Hernando do? Or what would Israel do? Or what would Daniela do? Um, and seeing them enjoy the position and, and really do so well, I was like, let's say 
60 or 80 percent of the way there thinking that that's what i wanted to do seeing their example was like oh no this is definitely something i want to do before before i graduate and sorry for the noise my cat is trying to get into the kitchen but, that's okay no worries um but yeah i don't know if that answers your question no definitely that no that was that was awesome um and i guess as chiefs you know what what do you look for in applicants that are applying to internal medicine residency this is for everyone i guess uh you know just to kind of continue the pattern dr munster do, would you like to start us off sure um so and i think i feel like i was talking to somebody about this today but um i don't i wouldn't say we look for anything super specific i think we try to find people that are dependable that are I think more than anything, and uh, we've seen how important this is, but really being responsive to feedback. Like you're, you can, we teach you the medical knowledge. We, you know, we want you to learn in residency. That's why people go to residency. Part of that learning process is giving and receiving feedback. So if you're, if it's hard, if you're somebody that doesn't respond to feedback, it's really hard for us to, to work with you. And, and, and I think that's probably the, the, first thing um there's a whatever i'll let i'll let them add to it i feel like i've been talking too much and if i have another point i'll i'll bring it up i can add um i think definitely an applicant we look for is someone that's like really even tempered and on the lines of being receptive to feedback it's how much they're willing to grow how much are they willing to be self-reflective because this, this is all a growing process like you're meant to grow professionally, personally, and grow into the position that you're meant to become. Um, definitely, we look for applicants who we feel would easily fit in within the program, who also have the mentality of like, you know, sometimes being on the pull list isn't fun. Sometimes working nights isn't fun, but we're here a for patients and we're here for the, you know, and the changes that we do or certain structures within the program, it's for the betterment of the program. It's not exactly, okay, it's not about me or my schedule or my call days. It's everyone has the same and you know maybe I have one extra call in this person or this person but some rotations have to be staffed some things have to have residents in them so understanding that on like a global scale about the thing doing things for the betterment of the program which in turn makes you a better physician and, and makes you understand things and have a little bit more I guess emotional intel intelligence intelligence with understanding those things as a follow-up question um I, I feel like residency is also partly um, like a crash course in learning leadership in some ways. Have you learned different ways to deliver feedback that's more effective than others? I know when I uh, first got any sort of leadership job, the first time I tried to give feedback, it was not well taken. And so I had to kind of learn over time better ways to deliver feedback that were more um, conducive to the person actually taking the advice that I would give them. But have you guys learned much about that or? So, like Ruben should answer that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so no, I I actually well besides of course education, I think feedback is something that well it's it's it's, it's an integral part of the leadership, the feedback, the the education. I think it's very important to have everything in 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 the same bag and try to dissect each thing because every single part of what we're talking about. For an educator, it's very, very important to, to have mastered. Having said that, we haven't. Um, <laughs> we're still learning. Um, we're trying We're trying to learn a lot. Something that has helped me a lot is, and I, I heard it recently, I don't remember which lecture or which video I saw, the difference between feedback and an assessment. So when you speak about feedback, that's something that has to be done immediately something that has to happen when the action that you want to price or you want to improve happen so let's say that rush presented me a patient on the weekend and he did a great job which he did by the way um <laughs> uh, so at that time i will tell him that he did a good job i wouldn't wait for the end of the rotation i don't wait until he's done thinking about that but if he for example forgot to pull past medical history he forgot that whole segment and he went just straight from hpi to physical exam and he went back and we have to fix a little bit the the hpi i will do it right away i will say look the presentation you include everything you really need to include this part and of course it's very hard and this is one of the toughest part 
but it's try to be non-judgmental. That's something that is very, very hard to do. And trying to know that you're both on the same team. Mm -hmm. You want both to be better. And, and by doing it at the same time and trying to have an approach that is non, you don't have to be aggressive. You have to be open for the feedback. It helps a lot in developing that relationship. Now, at the end of the rotation, um, that's, and I'm learning all this, I'm still reading, that's not a feedback, that's an assessment. And when you do that assessment, there shouldn't be new information. You should have done the feedback throughout the rotation. And at the end, you should say how everything went, the things that you said, everything that was done, and, and, and conclude like that. So I think feedback is something that has to happen. It has to happen during the rotation or during the time that you are working with someone. And you have to make sure, and that's really difficult, that you are in the same team. You know, sometimes we talk about the sandwich, about giving like good, uh, the good thing, the good news, the not so good news, and then the good news again. That's that's a technique that works. Sometimes you have to give feedback saying, look, you know, this didn't work well, and you have to take that person to the site and 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 you know give that feedback. Um, so I think it's a dynamic thing that we are still learning and it's very important um but having that non-judgmental open space is very important now one more thing about feedback the feedback doesn't just go one way yeah the feedback exactly. both goes both ways so yeah. if i'm able or if i'm giving feedback to rush rush should be able to give me feedback too to tell me how he liked my teaching um in my teaching methods if i like if he like how i was how i was presenting how i was talking about the case so i think that opens the space to be like we're learning together i'm not i'm not criticizing you we're here to learn together to improve all of us which for the record is yeah. fantastic teaching so oh thank you thank you so much amazing teaching for you know so um no, that, that's that's amazing. And, uh, you know, they're preliminary, switching gears a little bit, they're pre preliminary applicants, they're categorical applicants. You know, are there differences in how you guys maybe slightly train, you know, prelim uh, students versus the categoricals? Um, so actually, no, what, one thing that is nice about our program is that we really treat all of our residents the same. So to so much so the same that you don't know who is a prelim and who is an app and who is a categorical applicant. And when you're interviewing for different programs as a preliminary uh, resident, it, it is important to ask because some programs are going to say, you know what, we give our prelims more night flow because they're just here for a year or they have like, you know, sillier rotations or less or less, um, uh, less rigorous rotations because we don't really need them. We give them more ICU, but we actually really do treat everyone the same. Our prelim applicants, um, everyone gets a schedule of uh, 21 different schedules to choose from. So they all get from the same pool of schedules and it's still, it's all randomly picked, uh, randomly assigned by by a, a random lotto. So they all, they get treated the same, which I think is nice for them. And then it's always important as a prelim when you're going into your prelim years that even though you might be doing um, surgery or you might be doing uh, derm or something else, it's important to understand that you may think that internal medicine is not relative to you or it may not be useful information, but it always will be useful information. You're going to see a patient that has cardiovascular disease. You're going to have to see a patient that you're going to stop dual antiplatelet therapy before. There's going to be something from every rotation that you're gonna learn from. Um, so I think it's always very important to have that mentality when choosing a prelim program to understand that this is an important year for you. It, it wouldn't exist if it wasn't important or necessary, I, I think. And you know, choose a program where you feel you're gonna be treated fairly like the other residents. I love that. No, and I absolutely agree. I think that foundation of being a good doctor, you know, really starts with that prelim year. Um, and then carries on into whatever specialty that person chooses. So I, no, I love that answer tremendously. Um, if I could if, add, go ahead. Just like a, a small comment. So if you end up doing your prelim year at the same hospital where you do your advanced position, think of it as a networking point too. Like so, commonly we get uh, prelim residents that go into radiology, and so you'll have everybody's phone numbers and you'll know them already. So if you if you know, if I order a, a CT angio on somebody that they're that maybe they had one yesterday, 
you know, um, Dan can call me and be like, hey, man, you know, I saw that you ordered the CTA on this person. Are you sure that's what you want? Or, you know, hey, I would recommend actually an MRI or whatever. So you'll have a lot of those relationships um, already kind of pre, pre-done. Um, and on top of that extra, you know, internal medicine kind of, or if you end up doing a surgical prelim, um, that like background knowledge, that's, that's helpful for sure. And you could, you could make the argument that residency is also just, aside from learning things, is a big relationship builder. And, and it's all about how you leverage your relationships later on. It's like learning the ropes of the hospital, kind of. It gives you a little bit of an advantage. Yep, yep, for sure. And then all of our radiology friends always ask for the phones of the people they don't have. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right, so each of you just matched into fellowships. Um, I guess you guys kind of mentioned them before, but can you guys each uh, talk about the fellowship that you matched into and tell us kind of why you chose that specific field. Um, we can start with you, Dr. Mansour. Sure. Um, so I matched into pulmonary critical care at the uh, University of Florida. So go Gators. I'm supposed to say that now. Um, <laughs> why did I do pulm crit? So um, my rotation at Sinai was actually during fourth year that showed me the program and, and really made me want to go there for residency. It was actually the medical ICU for, for a month. Um, it was my first time um, being exposed to that side of medicine. It's very different for those that don't know. It's very different from your usual inpatient or outpatient, for sure. Um, you think about patients differently. The patients are usually way more sick. Um, and so I got there. It was the first time I saw an ECMO patient. I loved it. Um, I thought, you know, if there's a place in medicine where you really make a difference, it's, it's there. Um, sorry to the people that are interested in primary care. Um, basically, so yeah, so that was the first exposure. I loved it. Um, and then when I went into residency, I really, we were lucky that our, our ICU rotation, we don't, we didn't have fellows. Um, so we were kind of the, in addition, in conjunction with the attendings, we were like the primary decision makers. So we had a lot of autonomy for seeing patients, doing procedures, um, all with kind of that graded supervision that you get really, really good at. So as a, as a program, we're pretty strong in the ICU, which was good for me because that's what I ended up liking. Um, and it really just drove the interest home. And the biggest takeaway as far as like why I like it um, is I get, so when you're thinking about your career, you want to look for where you get your satisfaction from, right? Where you find meaning. And I feel like for me, it was equally meaningful to save somebody, and I put air quotes for people that are just not seeing the video, to save somebody from septic shock or DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, I get that same satisfaction or it's equally meaningful to the patient that's more terminal end stage. And you have to have those hard conversations with family members to thinking, like think, think about, you know, minimizing suffering and, and that sort of thing. I think both ends of the spectrum are equally meaningful and were equally satisfying to me as a, as a doctor. Um, and so that's what really pushed me towards pulmonary critical care. Um, and then for better or worse, the COVID pandemic really um, forced me to, to look at the pulmonary side of the, of the specialty. And I really enjoyed kind of the visual diagnosis aspect. So looking at x-rays, looking at CT scans, um, and as a bonus, we get to do procedures. So like bronchoscopies and, and lines and stuff like that. So it made the most sense and, and gave me the best of both worlds, pretty much. Thank you. And Dr. Muzaffar, how did you decide to go into um, Palm Crit? And I guess, tell us about where you matched as well. All right. So I matched at University of Massachusetts in uh, Worcester, uh, Massachusetts. So I'm very excited. Um, so I actually always loved ICU. I work as a dietitian specializing in critical care nutrition. So I always knew that I wanted to continue using my nutritional, my nutrition background, um, whichever specialty I chose. So I knew I would be able to continue to use that. And just like Ephraim said, I feel like in, in critical care, like it really is fulfilling and, and you have to look forward and say, where am I going to be happy? Where am I going to be fulfilled for the rest of my life? And I know I can walk into an ICU for the rest of my life and feel happy and not feel tired and feel like, okay, I get to do this today. I didn't really know much about pulmonary or I didn't really 
care for it that much until COVID happened. Um, and really understanding the lung physiology, really understanding um, the dynamics, ventilator management, um, and then getting the opportunity to do, bronco to do bronchoscopies as well. And then even now as chief year, you know, as we're starting to uh, teach residents and now we're at our pulmonary blocks, I'm actually enjoying going through different aspects of pulmonary. So I did, board, I did um, uh, IDSA guidelines on pneumonia. I did COPD, asthma. Uh, so actually going through those guidelines, making me like it and understand it a little bit more. And I see myself working as a pulmonologist, which area of pulmonology, because there's many areas, ILD, asthma, COPD, interventional. So that will that's yet to be determined uh, after fellowship. But I think um, the COVID pandemic really like, kind of opened up that world for me a little bit. And then we have, you know, phenomenal pulmonologists here and they let us do procedures and thoracentesis and things like that. So that was a really, um, that was a really uh, good to have that opportunity uh, during training. Okay, thank you. Um, can you explain to the audience um, the pathway that students need to take to go into pulmonary and critical care? Sure. So just like any specialty, um, some, certain specialties are a little bit more competitive. So cardiology, gastroenterology, hemonc, and then pulmonary critical care kind of goes up and down a little bit. Um, you really want to know a little bit earlier on, maybe towards the end of your PGY one year, I would say for the latest, even, even maybe a little bit earlier than that. Um, and really start during that time in the beginning of intern year, it is very difficult. So it's, it's a whirlwind of, you know, learning how to be an intern, not just the medical aspect of things, but just actually how to have a job and be a worker and be an employee and understanding how a hospital works, but definitely look towards your seniors, look towards, um, people who have matched in that field as you kind of get over the blur of the beginning of intern year start looking at what you want to do so let's reach out to cardiology fellows let's reach out to seniors who are who are matched in that area or who are interested in that area start looking at attendings and and finding mentors in that area and i think start thinking you know towards the end of first year hopefully you would have finished taking your step three or level three by then um, and then start focusing, I think, on research and always try to get your feet wet as a med student, start doing like little case reports, little posters, you know, submit it, submit it anywhere, submit it to the NOVA uh, research uh, field, uh, research competition, submit it to Florida ACP, submit it to FOMA. And once you get the confidence in submitting and getting accepted into those lower level um, uh, competitions, then start submitting to, you know, a ACC, CHEST, um, ATS, American College of Rheumatology. And those, and it's so easy to get a poster actually accepted to those things. So I would highly recommend doing that. The beginning, it's obviously difficult writing a poster, but as you do it more and more, it becomes a lot quicker. And then start thinking of ideas for projects. Uh, if you do residency in a research, um, University program, you know, it's a little bit research, a little bit more abundant, so it's easy to get kind of tagged onto a project in a community program such as ours. Um, it's a little bit harder, but the research is there. You can even start your own project. You can do observational projects. All three of us have have done that. We've all also done quality improvement projects as well. Um, so definitely, I would say early second year, late first year, you want to start getting the bigger projects started and start brainstorming and kind of getting those things done um, and, and and getting those things in action to kind of get prepared for uh, to fellowship and start getting things added to your CV. Okay, That's awesome. That was very, very informative. Thank you. And um, Dr. Prodominski, what made you interested in cardiology and would you mind just me sharing where, where you're going? And um... oh. yeah, of course. Um... Well, I'm much in cardiology at Toshner um, in New Orleans. So I'm so happy about that, Toshner Clinic Foundation. Um, I, you know, when you're writing your personal statement, you have that question. You always think, what made me go into cardiology? Because they want a lot of pages tell you, put your aha moment, put whenever you were in love with the specialty. <laughs> and I couldn't find one. I couldn't find the specific moment that it happened. And I think I had a similar path as what uh, Zuleika Nefraim are saying. I fell in love with it. Throughout the medical training, internal medicine, I decided early in my career during med school. And then I did rotations. I tried to experience everything in internal medicine that I could. And since Peru, I've been having mentors in cardiology. And it's been on and off, but I have been mentors in cardiology who show me how 
the cardiology world is, how the life is, the advanced the technology, the research, the everything, the clean, the clinical part. And I just started falling in love with it. In my work in Peru, I also had that. I had a lot of patients. I noticed that I started to, you know, get more involved in the care of the cardiac patients. Um, and then when I came to um, Monsan, I already knew that I wanted to be in cardiology. So I started doing projects. Again, I had a lot of good mentors in, in Mount Sinai, both attendings and fellows. So that helped me a lot going advancing into my love for cardiology, my research, and, you know, ended up in my, in my eventual match. So that's a little bit. It's, it's a little bit of uh, falling in love with it instead of having that aha moment. Um, regarding the, just, just to, just to continue with any advice that I have for, for people that want to go into cardiology, if you already know that you want to go into cardiology, you're completely sure I would advise to start doing research, to start getting involved with people that are already in the field, people that are already going through the process or already in the cardiology specialty, just as, as Zuleika said, um, I agree completely with the, just publishing um, you know, try not to publish just any project, but try to start publishing posters. And of course, always try to get that paper because the poster is the first part that you have to follow through with the paper. Um, and it's a little bit hard when you decide a little bit later. Um, in retrospect, uh, retrospectively, if I would know that I would like cardiology from intern year in Peru, I will have maybe done more research in that field. I did research in ID because at that time, that's what I liked. Um, but maybe have more research before getting involved in the field. And what I did as soon as I was in Mount Sinai, getting involved in the field, knowing the fellows, knowing the attendings, getting to work with them, which, where I learned a lot um, and continue building my my, my expertise in, in cardiology. So that's, that's, I think, how, how I went through everything. And I think that the most important part in all this process is just enjoy it. Um, I keep telling all, all the interns, uh, you know, it's, it's great to think about this as a specialty. It's important for you to build it. But in internal medicine, you are there to become a good internist, to become a good doctor, because every subspecialty, you, for every subspecialty, you are going to need to be a good internal medicine doctor. The cardiology, the cardiologists have to know about infective endocarditis. I just had a patient last week that had infective endocarditis, and I like, I like, of course, the cardiology part, but I have to know the indications, but I also have to know about the most common causes or the infectious causes of infective endocarditis. Um, and that goes for every single disease, every single thing. You have rheumatology, pulmonary, every single disease that could be related to your specialty. So the best thing is to enjoy the ride because this uh, the residency is really really a big growth and a really nice part of your life even if it's super stressful <laughs> because there are, there are parts that are very stressful and also it's it's important for you to become a good internal medicine doctor because then everything that, that will help with everything you do forward that's amazing thank you so much for sharing that and all incredibly valuable advice um and i guess shifting gears a little bit uh you know are there any particular challenges or setbacks uh, you all faced during residency that um, kind of stood out to you and, and how did you kind of grow from them and what advice would you give based off of those experiences to uh, medical students who are um, in general or, or who are going into residency? And we can start off with you, uh, Ruben, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, so some, some things that challenges, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot. Um, one of the first, as I said, one of the first things for me was becoming a good intern um, about knowing the system, knowing the place. That's sometimes something that you are going to need to go through your training and go with your seniors, trust your seniors, and be sure to get exposed as much as you can and try to read as much as you can because it's going to be a tough time. Um, and that's going to help you once you get comfortable with the place that you're training, with the place that you're working at, things get easier, things get better. You have more time to study. Your notes are more efficient, so you have more time to read about the patients. You have more time to spend with the patients. So as any job, 
you have to become more efficient. You have to know the job and that's for any job. You're going to take three to six months to, uh, to get to know where you're, where you're working now. So I would say for that, get to trust your seniors, trust the people around you and everyone, at least I was, I was, I'm happy to say that at, at our program, everyone was happy to help in that transition. I'm going to leave the other ones for my coach because there's there's a bunch of those but <laughs> that's awesome Dr. Mansur would you would you like to share any experiences sure um I can't not to say I didn't have any hurdles but nothing's really come into mind straight away but something I'll I'll take I'll answer your question is what would you recommend people do leading up to residency I would say uh and this is more for the post match fourth year so hopefully you guys soon um, enjoy it. Enjoy the time. You know, don't feel like you need to study. Um, really, really um, take the time. And I think me and Raj were talking about this earlier today, but really take the time to really get clear on your like wellness routine, so to speak. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you get into your habits of working out or going to the movies or like cooking, if that's your thing, but really figure out what you do to de-stress and really build that practice. Because when you start residency, you're going to be trying to figure out so many things, like what Ruben was saying about figuring out the system, learning the hospital, that kind of stuff, that the last thing you want to try to figure out is your wellness routine. So try to make sure that before you start, you have that ironed out pretty well, um, and and you'll that'll be a solid foundation um, to take you through. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Mazaffer, would you like to add anything? So I think one of the struggles um, that I had during the COVID pandemic, uh, def definitely, and I, I know a lot of us had, was definitely the mental burnout and the mental health issues because of being put in this the situation that no one had ever seen before. And to kind of combine what both uh, Ruben and Ephraim said was that like, you are gonna be faced with any, with burnout. You are gonna be faced with, you know, difficult times. You know, ours was a pandemic, but there might be family issues. There might be personal life. There might be, you know, difficult patient. And I think foreseeing those things that are gonna happen and learning how to mitigate them. And like Ephraim said, having a good wellness routine and learning to really disconnect from the hospital. I think that was something that I could have done better in residency. I felt like I always kind of took my patients home. I felt like I always never really gave myself that mental break when I was on, when I was off during that time. So I think now, like, for example, when I'm off, like, I really make sure that I'm off. Like, I turn my phone off. I turn off social media. I don't, I don't, I pretend, like, not, not that this, I don't do this in a bad way, but I pretend that Sinai doesn't exist sometimes just so I can, like, kind of get that physical separation and that mental separation from that. And that has really helped me a lot. So having, like, having a really good and uh, wellness routine and making that a priority as well because sometimes like you don't make it a priority because you have notes to finish you come home there's laundry to do some people have kids and other responsibilities so really making in and scheduling that time the same way you would schedule in conference you would schedule in certain things and and making that a priority that way you can really focus on yourself and, and you know if, if you can't be well how are you going to treat patients and make them well you know because it, it's a very empathic thing that we do every day and it sometimes it could be draining for some people i've learned that i'm very introverted so a lot of giving I have to replenish that for myself and if I don't take that time to replenish it you know I'm just walking around like a zombie and I think it's important to replenish yourself and take that time that you need that you need for yourself thank you so much I have one more quick question based on um, the advice that you guys have given at what point would you recommend that um, first year residents or maybe before take step three as soon as you can as soon as you can, definitely yeah. as soon as you can um the thing is that sometimes depending on when your program starts some programs will give you an academic stipend um to pay for that so you have to kind of take it after you start third year but if you can afford it financially and you do have the time i mean sorry after first year but if you could afford it and financially do it 
um, before you even start. I know a lot of IMGs do it before they start. And I think that that, that is very smart. Um, I always recommend to first years is that, you know, the beginning is very difficult and, and there's a lot of things to do, learning in the hospital and your new role, but definitely aim to take it between like uh, late fall, winter in your first year, I think is a good time because you settled in, you kind of have a routine and you kind of know what to expect. And then as you go into second year, you want to focus more on what specialty you choose and moving on to the next steps if you choose to do fellow so I think definitely in first year, um, before you finish first year, is, is, is a good idea. And also, and also that point, just to add it, once you finish with your step three, you're going to think about your next step, which are the boards. So, <laughs> so, so, yep. so you know, you're going you're, you're gonna to study for the boards regardless because you're studying internal medicine or working internal medicine. But until you take the step three, you still feel that it's there. There is this, <laughs> you know, reminder in the back of your mind is I have to take the step three. It still, you know, of course, you're going to read about all your patients, but, you know, I would say as soon as soon as you're able, after you accommodate it to the first part, try try to take it and then you can focus on internal medicine, which is what you have to do. And of course, your specialty. Yeah. And it makes sense, too, because you'll be the closest to all the other materials. Right. So if you're thinking about an internal medicine resident, right, you'll be the closest to the OB or the psychiatry knowledge that you bank from medical school that you don't really necessarily see on a daily basis. So it'll be a little bit easier for you to take the exam when you're still sort of fresh, so to speak, on that. I mean, yeah, you'll study and you'll have to review some stuff, but uh, maybe some of the questions that you didn't see as a practice test, the knowledge will still be fresh for you by the time you take the test. Versus if you take it in third year and you're kind of struggling to remember some of the details that maybe you knew in, in med school. Got it. That makes sense. And I also had one last question too. Um, yeah, Dr. Minister, you had mentioned like uh, having a wellness routine kind of ironed mm -hmm. out stuff beforehand. Um, you know, as, as you all know, sometimes things get in the way. Sometimes that routine just goes out the window. You know, what do you do in those moments where you're like, oh my God, like everything that I thought was going to happen this week is not happening. And now mm -hmm. I'm stressed. Like how, what's your thought process in like kind of breaking all that down and regaining some sort of composure? For sure. So um, a couple of things. I try to move away from, and I say this as somebody who doesn't always follow this, but try to move away from the all or nothing. Like, you know, if, if you can't, you know, wake up at 430, meditate for 26 minutes and then work out for 44 minutes <laughs> and then take a sauna and then take a shower and then go to work, like at least pick one thing that's most important to you to, to get done and maybe say, you know what, I don't have enough time to do a full workout. I'll do some of it or I can't work out, but I'll meditate and stretch and, and try to, if, but if that does it for you, but kind of thinking of the things that help you decompress, you can kind of pick and choose the sort of minimum effective dose at the risk of sounding extremely nerdy. Um, yeah, kind of, and go from there and look at your week and fit little bits and pieces here and there. And that'll, that'll help you get through it until you have that time to get back to your full sort of re regimen or, or routine and something something to us something that we we learn in our program we have actually a whole curriculum in this about wellness and mindfulness and it's learning how to identify those moments when you are feeling a certain way or you're feeling you're losing control and knowing how to react to them knowing what's going on what's happening and how to how to uh, deal with the situation in a different way. Um, I like to think about, you know, the quote unquote outlets. Um, I used to be an all sports guy. Uh, every time I, have, I was very stressed or very nervous or I had some problems, I used to run, go biking, but that's not always possible in residency or being even a fourth year medical student is very hard. Sometimes you have to do a lot of things. Um, I learned to incorporate some meditation um, into my routine. So sometimes you just have five minutes to ground yourself and that's all you need. And it doesn't have to be a full ancient meditation technique. It can, it can be close your eyes, listen to your breath and stop for a second. Stop all those thoughts, stop everything, ground yourself and then continue. And, and it's very important to have these techniques of knowing how to control everything that you're feeling and everyone has a different way some some people feel like that while cooking macaroons some people feel like that while chopping wood 
Um, so you're going to have, <laughs> I'm just referring to the other chief, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so you're going to have your own way. And it's very important to know, to know these techniques and which ones work for you, because not, not two people are the same. Not no one's gonna be like me that they are crazy about doing exercise to relax or can do a 20 minutes power nap or a five minute meditation. But you're gonna find your own way. And the most important thing is to find these techniques, these ways of, of decompressing and, and knowing what Ephraim said is really true. It's not all or nothing. If you don't do exercise one day and can only do meditation, that's fine. Next day you'll do exercise and you will add meditation when you're post call and you have more time. So it's very important to be a little bit flexible, of course, that that's sometimes hard, <laughs> especially as doctors that we like to have things very, everything scheduled. Um, but having those techniques, having those resources for you. And of course, always, 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 if you need more help, ask for it. That's very, very important because this is a very, very stressful career. This is a very stressful path. And sometimes we just need to talk to someone. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be someone special. It have to be maybe your friend or your chief or, you know, maybe an attending um, or your dad or your mom or whoever, whoever you want to. So just remember that you have people around and, and that can be a way to also relieve, uh, get a relief from those stressful moments. And then also to um, kind of reiterate what they both said, I think it's important to not lose yourself. And it's, sometimes it's very easy to lose yourself in your work and get caught up. So those little hobbies that you have, it's important to still cultivate your own interests outside of medicine. And I think, and use mental energy on those things. And I think that's very important. Sometimes it is hard because you're in ICU and you can't do that all the time, but still make an effort to cultivate your interest outside of medicine. And then also like understand in the beginning it is overwhelming you're not going to have time to go to the gym five days a week but to also kind of lower your expectations a little bit and when I, what i mean when i say that is like let's say you're on board and you're like okay sign up at three i'm gonna leave at three you're gonna set yourself up if you don't leave at three and what what's gonna happen so i always when i was on board especially on like wards call i'm like I don't, I don't make plans. I don't make anything. I'm like, if I leave at 11, I leave at 11. And that's the expectation, you know? So certain rotations, you kind of have to be flexible in that way. But then you have, for example, your clinic week. So you know, for the most part, you're going to be out at five. So those weeks, you can maybe plan a little bit in more detail and be a little bit stricter in, in, in those ways. But I think um, kind of lowering your expectations and knowing when to do that and knowing that, okay, when I'm on ICU, I'm not going to be able to cook like a three course meal. But when I'm on clinic, I'll be able to do that. And then I think planning, like I'm someone that like, I like to plan my meals. I like to plan like when I'm doing laundry that way. Like, for example, I, I like to do laundry in the morning because I'm, I'm so tired when I get home. So like kind of planning how you're going to take care of yourself and doing those self-care things, I think is, an, is, is important as well, because sometimes you'll just not think about it. And then like you have no more scrubs for the, you know, for the rest of the week, you know? So I think it's important to plan and kind of like manage your expectations, depending on which rotation you are, or where you are in your training. Thank you. All of your answers were tremendously helpful. Um, and super inspirational. I, so. mm -hmm. I don't have any more questions. Do you have any more questions, Raj? I do not. This was a lot of fun, incredibly informative. And, you know, we thank you all so much for, for joining us and, you know, for giving us some of your wisdom. The Medical Muse is produced by Timothy Crow. Your hosts are Daniel Epstein and Raj Kavadi. Social media team, Anja Van der Osten, Ava Sini, and Nisarg Shah. Music on the show by Foxy Music. Attention listeners, if you or a colleague are interested in interviewing on The Medical Muse, reach out to us on social media. Give us a follow on Instagram at the underscore medical underscore muse. See you next time. <laughs>